It all started here, Butler Gymnasium on the campus of St. Bonaventure University. It was late fall of 1919, and the St. Bonaventure men's basketball program was born. Now we're at the 100th year anniversary. The program has galvanized itself to the community, and in fact, all of Western New York. It started here with the humble beginnings in Butler Gym, moved on to the Olean Armory, where at one point the Bonnies won 99 straight games, and then, of course, in 1966, with the Riley Center and the crowds that still flock there every game night. And the celebration seemed not complete without an all-time team. 500 Bonnies have worn that uniform in different eras, but how do you pick them? And so the approach was this. And we're all set to go here. Yeah. past 47 years, it's been my responsibility and privilege to chronicle St. Bonaventure basketball in columns for the Olean Times Herald. So how did we come up with the 60 players? Well, the first half was easy. 35 of them are already in the St. Bonaventure Athletic Hall of Fame. The other 25 we came up with, and that master list of 60 became the working list that produced the all-time team. The other three people who worked with me on coming up with those names Starting on my left, Mike Vaccaro, 89 graduate of St. Bonaventure. And as soon as he got out of school, he came right to the Times Herald, he became a beat man and covered the team for two years. When it comes to objectivity in St. Bonaventure basketball, he has none. <laughs> Keep that in mind. On his left is J.P. Butler. J.P. started coming to Bonnie games when he's a young boy. And he's about to enter his 12th season covering the Bonnies for the Times Herald. But he also has a connection with the past because his grandfather, Ed, played for the Bonnies in the 1940s. And finally, to my right, Gary Neese is about to begin his 25th season as the voice of the Bonnies. And I guarantee you, there's no human being who has seen more live Bonna basketball games in the last quarter century than Gary. And Vac, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, it was an interesting charge. It was a privilege to do this, but because of the length of time and how statistically overwhelmed we are with current players, did you find it difficult to figure out and quantify where the players from the previous era belonged? Yeah, I did because look, it's hard for, uh, to, to really judge players in the 50s because what we all rely on are grainy video, nowhere near the kind of modern statistics we have for the younger players, the younger generation players. Uh, a lot of it is really kind of an oral history almost, you know, people telling us what it was like to watch those players in the Olean Armory, at the Buffalo Wad, in the NIT. It was difficult because you don't want to shortchange those players because it was on those players' backs that the foundation of the program was really built. We're over 500 players in the history of Bonaventure. We have 60, and that was a tough choice to get to 60. Getting to 20 was even tougher. The quality of the products that the players had been brought in here to play and represent St. Bonaventure is, is just unreal. And e even to be in the top 60, you're basically in the top 10% of players to ever right. play here. Mm -hmm. That's quite an honor in and of itself. One of the problems we faced besides the history and quantifying the players from the 30s, 40s, and 50s, in recent years, the Bonnies have had huge contributions from short-time players. Uh, Marcus Posley and Kevin Houston and Matt Mobley are kind of burned into people's memories but is it right for us to put in a short-term player competing with players who played their whole careers here? That's a good question, and my thought with that is that I certainly think they uh, belong on the 60-player ballot, and they can be recognized in that way for the contributions that they made in their, in their time here. There's no denying uh, you know, how good of a player Matt Mobley, Marcus Posley were. One of the things we look at when judging these guys is if, if they're a thousand point scorer or not. These guys were thousand point scorers in only two seasons here, so you can't lose sight of that. Gary, in your case, human nature is that we tend to remember the things that happened most recently. And we're overwhelmed with statistics, but I think people don't realize assists didn't become an official statistic until the mid 70s. Block shots, uh, steals, they didn't become a stat until the mid 80s. 
The three-point field goal didn't come until the 86-87 season, so we're just inundated with these numbers, but making choices on the players from the previous decades, it's a little more difficult. It's, it's very difficult, Chuck. Uh, one of the things that I relied on in, in making my list was actually talking with some of those players and coaches playing back in the 40s and 50s. Bob Sassone immediately comes to mind and a couple of other players that I was able to talk to from the 60-61 team and really getting an idea of how they functioned and the philosophies of their coaches, Eddie Donovan. I think that helped me at least consider them for this top 20 team. Okay, Vec, let's start with uh, our top fives. You first. I'd be very surprised if uh, any of our top fours uh, differ. Uh, but mine, uh, Bob Lanier, that was kind of an easy one. Tom Stith, also an easy one. Andrew Nicholson, who you know, not only revived the program, but actually reminded all of us just to what heights you could achieve. He's number three on my list. Jalen Adams, and you can really say the same things about him. I said about Andrew Nicholson because uh, really the, the, the renaissance of the modern Bonnie's kind of peaked on his watch. And I have number five, Essie Hollis. I think that's one where we could probably have a few other people debate. But uh, Essie was the best player on the only national champion in, in, uh, in school history. So that's who I went with. I have the same top four as Mike. And I thought the top three, in, in my opinion, would maybe be somewhat of a lock. And then maybe starting at four, you could differentiate. And, and with Bonnie, there are so many great guards. Um, but I thought Adams, any way you look at it, um, was as deserving of that spot as anybody from a statistical standpoint, from the idea of him being a, a, a conference player of the year, uh, an All-American honorable mention, and getting a team to the NCAA tournament. My number five, I went with Greg Sanders, um, giving him the nod because of the fact that you know, he's the all-time leading scorer in school history. Well, I, I went a little old school here with the top five. Obviously, the, the first three I had uh, were, were very easy. Bob Lanier, Tom Stith, uh, basically they were the face of, of the St. Bonaventure program. They still are. Andrew Nicholson, you know, he really brought this team and university back to prominence along with his coach. Greg Sanders was an easy pick. My fifth pick was Fred Crawford. I've got a coin at home that's wore out because I've been flipping a coin for about a month and a half now trying to figure out guys on this team. Essie Hollis, Fred Crawford were 5'6", and I went with Crawford. Uh, obviously, you, you look at the talent that he had, the team around him, early 60s, uh, after the 61 team, he carried the program for the two years that he, that he played after. Uh, the Stith brothers. So I had him in there and obviously uh, he went on to a, to a nice pro career and was able to uh, again get that Bonaventure name out there in the 60s. My top five is a little different as well. Uh, obviously Lanier and Tom Stith are no-brainers. My third pick was Freddie Crawford. Uh, had a five-year pro career with five different teams. Um, his scoring numbers in only three years, he's seventh all-time list, um, is a very proficient player. Greg Sanders, I put number four. Yes, he's the all-time leading scorer. He, went, he was on the championship NIT team in 77, but the following year he's also in the NCAAs, and that's not without significance. But the other factor to me that really tipped me over was when he played, the three-point field goal did not exist. And I think it's not unreasonable, those of us who covered him, and I did, to say that a third of his field goals, and he had 944, a third of his field goals would have been three-pointers. So that would have put him over 2,500 points. It just happened to be he was an unfortunate situation chronologically. My fifth is Essie Hollis. He was a special guy, and he was more than just a great basketball player. He really became kind of the face of St. Bonaventure during the time he played here. The two names missing from my top five are Jalen Adams and, and Andrew Nicholson. And, and Andrew was sixth, and, and, and Jalen was seventh on my list. <laughs> The first part was easy because all you do, you, you go out into Riley Center and you look at those banners with the numbers on them. And those guys, they're automatically on the team. And then, and then you, you know, so that leaves you 12 picks out of all the players that have played for St. Bonaventure. Like JP, I picked Ken Murray. He's, he's on the bottom part of the list, but there's the first guy that scored 1,000 points in a career for St. Bonaventure. I picked Mark Jones from those 80 teams, made the NIT one season, just missed getting into the NCAA 
with uh, a loss in the Atlantic 10 championship game. Earl Belcher is a two-time player of the year. That was, that was an easy pick as well. Of course, he's, he's listed up there now in number 25. Uh, I did stay with Whitey Martin from that 60 team. Uh, again, uh, a situation where there was no assist and, and who got the ball to Tom Stith all that time. You know, so uh, I picked uh, guys like that. Uh, I agree with Sam Stith, uh, and, and I also went with Larry Weesey. Now, I know he's known for more outside a player, but he was a heck of a player in that, in that 57 team. And that began, his, his senior year began that stretch where they went to the NIT, eventually to the NCAA. Uh, and then, you know, obviously what he did afterwards, uh, coaching, uh, getting to the Final Four, uh, being the administrator here for many years. Uh, I know that that doesn't mean player, but when you look at his stats, he also was a pretty good player. I was surprised that uh, I only had three guys from the Final Four team. I know that sounds kind of funny because I know it sounds like everybody kind of struggled with it. I did include Calbaugh. I included uh, Matt Gant. Uh, I don't think you can possibly say enough about what that team meant, not only in its time, but what it continues to mean. We're sitting here in the Hall of Fame room, and one of the most prominent things you look at when you go out into the court, you see Final Four in 1970. And it almost seems unrealistic because we know what college basketball is like in a modern time. And I understand that it was a different time then, but it was still, you know, but was it really? Because it was post Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. So it wasn't that far, uh, far ago. It was 50 years ago. That's a long time. But the idea that, uh, that this school played in the Final Four, um, to, to me, I mean, it was, it was important for me to kind of recognize that. I didn't include Bubba Gary. He would have been also, also probably one of my last five out. I don't know if I was trying to justify it too much, but the fact that three of those guys from that team were on it, and I also have three guys from the NIT team, and Hagen, Hollis, and Sanders. It was, it was important to me, I think, to recognize the team accomplishments that have really kind of defined what this program is also. And the way to do that was to include other members in the team that might have, you might have given a nod to those guys over someone else. For me, it kind of started with, uh, okay, you've got uh, some of your obvious guys, you got your 10, 12, 13 obvious guys, uh, and then it was honing in on who, just, just name by name, who I thought, okay, they, they probably have to be on here until that got to 20, and then I took a look at who was left off, and the question was, okay, can I, can I live with that, or do I have to look at this guy and say, you know what, no, he just, he, he has more of a case than somebody I have on now. And I didn't really have a whole lot of that um, to me, uh, as long as I was able to uh, sort of justify why they were where they were, then it, it was okay to know that it's unfortunate because there are so many great names here, but they're just uh, going to be on the outside of that, of that top 20. In my case, with VAC, I've got three guys from that 77 team. Uh, obviously, Hollis and Sanders and, and Glenn Hagen. Uh, what I, I sort of feel badly about is that I feel like that's on my list, the 70s team, that 70 team is, is underrepresented because after Lanier, I have no other player from that team. Although, as I mentioned, Billy Calbaugh and, and to a lesser extent, Matt Gant were on that list, but they were like in, in, in the first four or five, four or five out. The beginning of David Vanderpool's career, the team was horrible. And yet, there's no way that anybody who saw him play didn't say this is one of the top 20 players to ever walk on this campus. So it really is kind of kind of interesting to to see how we we quantify these 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 circumstances. And and I guess though the the one thing that surprises me, I I do feel like the 70s team was the 1970 team was underrepresented by me. But then I think also back to the 50s teams, and, and you mentioned Larry Weesey, Gary, but Bob Sassone was a tremendous player for his era in the early 50s. Uh, but, you know, we didn't get to see him play. The numbers are, the team was successful, but we don't have a lot of comparative numbers. And, and so those guys, they're not forgotten, but they become blurred in history because we're overwhelmed with so many other stats that we can use to make our, to make our choices. Uh, what's neat about this is once the list of 60 players was, was selected, uh, fans were invited to vote online, and there were over 2,000 responses. But it was up to us to come up with 60 names. And then from that, us and the fans, via online voting, we're going to come up with the all-time Bonnet team.
I guess we're about down to the time where we can open this up and find what we actually, what we actually have. First four names are not surprising to me because I had them among my first four, which is Bob Lanier, Andrew Nicholson, Jalen Adams, Tom Stith, and Greg Sanders uh, is the uh, is the uh, the fifth name, and I'll I'll go to war with that starting five any time. Uh, look, I think I, I think what's great about this about the school is one, you do have a, a cornerstone guy, and I don't think anybody could possibly have taken part in this poll and not had Bob Lanier as number one. I, 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 it, it's, it'd be curious to see how many top Division One programs uh, would have a player that was that much of a uh, obvious cornerstone, and I think, I think it's really cool that we have that. And what's interesting is that uh, uh, Lanier, Nicholson, Adam Stith, and Sanders were all uh, five for five among both us and the fans. So. Uh, that's pretty neat to see also. Next five here. So J.R. Brummer, Essie Hollis, Fred Crawford, Earl Belcher, and David Vanderpool were uh, the other five guys who, who went five for five on, on the list among the four of us and the fans. And again, that's uh, hard to argue with. And that's, you know, again, pretty close to uh, what I had and I think what a, what a lot of us have had and have been talking about today. It, it looks like there's also maybe some of that generational influence that if you're a fan from a certain time, you're going to vote and almost, you know, kind of stand up from the guys from your time. So I'm willing to bet that, uh, you know, there may be some older fans who, who put more uh, stock into those guys from the 50s and maybe more uh, people from my time who are voting more for the Nicholsons and Adams, the J.R. Brummers and Marcus Greens. That seems like it should be the cutoff, right? If you're going to have a, a creme de la creme, so you're talking about the upper half of the top 20, it's a unanimous for those 10. Right. And I think those right. are I think those are 10 worthy names to be included in that kind of a, of a crowd. David Vanderpool's the 10th, the 10th man on that team. Uh, I'll go to war with that team. Yeah, the third team, so-called third team, uh, Sam Stith, Glenn Hagen, Marcus Green, uh, Tim Wynn, and Bill Butler. And uh, again, you, when you look at that, uh, two of those five are up on the, on the, on the banner, uh, having their numbers retired, uh, Sam Stith and, and Bill Butler. Glenn Hagen, probably one of the clutch players in Bonaventure history, uh, one of those guys who always wanted the ball in his hands at the end. Marcus Green, uh, I know you mentioned it, Marcus, uh, his career kind of got uh, clouded over with, with the scandal that happened. But on a side note, I give him tremendous credit for staying with the program after it happened. He could have easily said, I'm out of here, and walk out, play one more year with, with a good team. He stayed and, and kept this program alive. And uh, Tim Wynn, Tim is one of my favorite guys. If you needed to stop, he stopped him. Uh, and just the way he played defense, uh, was, was, you know, he would just walk up to you and take the ball away from you. And if you, if you got in the way, he'd knock you down and the referee wouldn't call him. You know, just one of those guys. But uh, he was a leader. Uh, if you saw him off the court, uh, he had those guys in tow. He had that entire team in tow. And, and you're talking about some pretty good players back then with Caswell Cyrus and Peter Van Possen, uh, uh, Patricio Prado, that crew. Uh, when they made the uh, NCAA, and then, uh, you know, and that was Tim's senior year, but he also made the, the NIT as a sophomore, and he was the leader on that team as a sophomore, so I, I'm really glad to see Tim win on this third team. The uh, fourth team uh, is Glenn Price, Mark Jones, Matt Gant, George Carter, and Billy Calbaugh, and this is weird, but in the case of Glenn P Price and Mark Jones, all four of us voted for those two guys. Uh, the fans did not. Mark Jones is really one of the good gets for Jimmy Sadlin before he left. He was just a highly touted player from the Rochester area. And Glenn, uh, I was still working in radio then, but I remember him being a very impressive player, but it's almost as if he's dispatched from the memory of the fans. Yeah, I mean, I like to think that I am as well versed in Bonaventure history as anybody. I've never seen a second of him play. And what I know of him is what you've told me and what Bob Sasson has told me and what other people who have watched the program for a long time have told me. And so I, and of course, in, in, the, in the raw numbers of how many points he scored, but he's a guy who probably deserved, of all the guys here, I think he's the guy that I would say probably deserved to go five for five and didn't go five for five. He's not only on my list, but he was a, almost a borderline top 10 guy. Uh, I mean, those are incredible numbers for, for only three years. Well, I had him number 15. 
And sometimes I have to reach back and the players from another era and think, what did that guy look like? I don't have to do that with Glenn Price. He had an unforgettable hairdo. And, uh, but he was such a productive guy. And I was, at, I was working radio then, and, but I had tickets to the Bonna games from the radio station. I came and saw him play probably for the last two years of his career. And I was, I was really impressed. And I'm, I'm, I'm really glad he made it here, even though I didn't vote for him, Matt Gant. He belongs in that top 20. I didn't have him there, but, but it's nice to see him there. George Carter, I'm prejudiced because I put him there. And Billy Calbaugh is Billy Calbaugh. And, you know, there's a guy who it's hard to quantify statistically based on what was kept then, but clearly he deserves to be there. As Vac said, somebody had to get Bob, Bob Lanier the ball. Yeah. You know, it's funny for Calbaugh and Gant, I think, you know, a lot of ways uh, they proved what they were and had to repress in the Final Four. You know, Calbaugh suddenly had to become a shooter because Bob wasn't there anymore. Uh, there's a famous picture that appeared in the Washington Post the day after uh, the semifinal game with uh, Matt Gant winning the center jump off of Artis Gilmore. That's the fun of doing something like this, is how you perceive guys and where you put them. The other question now, Vac, becomes who, did, who would you had as your first ones out? You know, the ones that really popped to mind, I know, I know Whitey Martin was on a lot of lists uh, the first time around. Uh, the nature of the way the program has gotten the last 25 years, there have been players that have kind of forced him out of there. Um, he's definitely a guy that uh, that, that, that merited consideration. Um, I, I think certainly a Jim Barron could have gotten consideration. Uh, certainly, if you want to include his uh, his, his post playing career, but uh, you know he was at, much like Essie Hallis. He was mostly the reason besides Greg Greg Sanders why they won the 1977 NIT. I have Greg Sanders as my number six. That's not a bad sixth man to bring into a game. No. And I think you had you, you had Andrew sixth or seventh. That's not a bad sixth or seventh man to bring into a game right. too. So it's it's funny because I think that Greg Sanders in a lot of ways would have been the perfect you know microwave type six man player. I think Marquez Green is probably the third for me that I didn't include include on my list. Unfortunately, I think he gets obscured by what happened and we kind of forget just what a dynamic player he was and I know that probably kind of affected me in terms of assessing his place on this list. Well it's interesting you mentioned the Marcus Green situation that gives you an idea of just what the variation can be in a project like this because I've got Marcus Green in my top 10. Uh, the idea that Jalen could be the greatest guard in school history from a scoring standpoint he's number one and, and then all of the credentials that come with it Marcus is right there with him and even ahead of him in a, in a lot of statistical aspects. Um, but you're right, the one thing that uh, maybe brings him back a little bit is the era that he, is, that he played in. The, the guys who are just left out, Whitey Martin was one of those guys. And, and, and it, it was, I wasn't quite sure what to do with some of the older names on the list. Those guys in a lot of ways are really maybe even more decorated than, than some of these names now because of the era they played in. And, and so how do you leave them off? But that, that's kind of what I ended up doing with, with a lot of the older guys. You know, I, I think you, you give a lot of extra consideration to people you did see a lot. Somebody I, I really wanted to vote for just because he was a great player who was my classmate was Rocky Llewellyn. Had a great career, but played on some very forgettable teams. And at the end of the day, I think you have to you know, you have to put your personal feelings aside. I would love to have been able to find a place for Rocky on the list, but he's probably somewhere around 24 or 25 for me. I easily could have put Miles Aiken there, easily. And the other person, and his name hasn't come up, but I just liked him as a player, and in his own way, he was kind of the face of the Bonnies during the Jim O'Brien era, was Barry Munger. And I could have lived with putting those three in the last three spots as opposed to the ones I have. But one of the things that did happen, uh, because there was an idea, not only to list the top 20, but to rank the players numerically, point-wise. In other words, if you picked some, some, uh, Bob Lanier number one, he got 20 points all the way back down to one. And he, um, he edged Ken Murray. Uh, you know, it's funny, Ken's, Ken's a guy I know the least about. I dealt with Billy a lot over, over the years. And, and I guess if I was to be, somebody stopped and asked me, which one of those guys should be the number 20? I just, from, from my standpoint, Billy would have been the guy. And I feel almost like it's not fair because I, I've never seen film on, it's like you said, I've never seen film on Ken Murray. I've just know what he accomplished and about the thousand point score, first one in history. And he, was, and he was also an accomplished player. Obviously he scored the points that he scored and you can't just dismiss that. And as I said, I mean, one of the things that I think all of us had to, had to deal with almost from a conscious standpoint is that you don't want to shortchange the guys of Ken Murray's era, Ken Fairfield, 
Larry Weesey, Bob Sassone, all of those players, because without those teams coached by Eddie Melvin and Eddie Donovan, none of what came after would have been possible. Because, you know, you look at the history of Bonaventure basketball, and before 1950, it was basically SUNY Oswego. Not that there's anything wrong with SUNY Oswego, but it was a, <laughs> it was a nice, small, little regional, regional school. Suddenly, post-1950, what's the difference? Well, you're not only getting great players, but you're playing competitive schedules competitive enough to where you can wind up in the NIT, and so you fill a wall now with a lot of banners, and whether we like to believe it or not, most of those banners were filled from between 1951 and 1961. And so what we have now as part of our Bonaventure tradition, Bonaventure legacy, was born by guys like Ken Murray, and I think that uh, it's important to note that he belongs in this conversation, as do a few of the other guys that you mentioned earlier. One of the things that's interesting about the way the votes went it's not reflected in what the four of us did, but as I mentioned earlier, fans tend to remember the things that happened closest by. And there are two players who have been huge contributors to the most recent Bonna teams. Matt Mobley, Courtney Stockard, extremely popular with the fans, very productive. Uh, in the grand scheme as we viewed it, they didn't belong in the top 20, but to the fans who show up here, Every home game over the last couple of years, these, these players are a little bit bigger than life, but I think we were not wrong in not having them in our top 20. And as far as Mobley is concerned, he was probably as athletic a player as Bonaventure has ever had. And some of the things he did and some of the nights he had where he just couldn't miss from three, as great as Jalen Adams was, I mean, Mobley was almost you know, filthier when it came to, when he was hot, nobody was more fun to watch. So I totally understand how both of those guys would have been so popular among the fans and included in this vote. And these guys have the benefit of just sort of the emotional pull. Uh, it's very easy to remember the, the terror that Mobley went on at the end of his senior year. Uh, that game he had against Richmond in the 8-10 tournament hit eight, eight, eight or nine three-pointers. He was just uh, unbelievable at that point, unbelievable. Which, as we know, is the game that ultimately will probably wind up getting him in the tournament. That's a great point. And, and then, uh, like you said, with, with Courtney, I mean, he really did become almost a mythic figure. He was so uh, beloved for what he was able to overcome. And, and it's very easy. It, it, it's it's uh, so recent that he had that game against UCLA, I mean, to me, one of the all-time Bonner performances um, that you can think of that and say, hey, you know what, or, or the fact that uh, I, I think Courtney had just become so well-liked as a person around here that people want to say, hey, this is a guy that I want to put on my list, and it just so happens that a lot of people kind of felt that way, and so now all of a sudden they appear, um, you know, as we said, not just at uh, 20 in the fact they were they were well in uh, on the fan voting which right. is kind of an interesting thing um, but to me just uh, again the fact that these names were included in that list of 60 um, is the is the tip of the cap that they should should have in this in this exercise yeah, I would argue fairly or unfairly that if if they hadn't been snubbed that year you, you would have not only had the two guys we're talking about but also probably Posley would have been among the fans' choices, and I think Deion Wright would have been among the fans' choices. You know, again, he's a guy that we like to think of as a quintessential Bonaventure player. Didn't play at all as a freshman, played sparingly as a sophomore, came on as a junior, and you know, as a senior was a, was a star. But the point is that we're talking not only about, we're, we're not only glorifying guys that are, that, that, that are dusty names in, our, in a history book. So we've been able to include not only the older guys, but the younger guys because the program remains relevant. And the fact that there's so many of the guys that we can debate between 21 and 25, and even going on to 30 if we wanted to, I think that really tells you a little bit about what the program is and what it's been able to maintain. I'd like to thank all of the fans who voted, over 2,000, which is really impressive. And I've got to say, speaking for all of us, it was a lot of fun for us to do this as well. And uh, we're pretty proud of this 20-man team.